want to do more than anything else is wear my uh, political hat as a former Secretary General of a, or General Secretary of a political party, which I was for nearly 13 years, uh, during which time I was also a member of two houses of the Oireachtas, and uh, served the party executive and, as the, and simultaneously the parliamentary party, so very much the spider at the centre of the web. Um, because this is a political problem, as you've heard, and I completely agree with it. This is not a banking problem. This is a public finances problem, and every public finances problem <clears throat> is essentially a political problem. So that's why we're looking at the politics of Greece uh, from this particular hat. And, um, I'm starting with the party system. What struck me uh, more forcibly than I, than, than I would have expected is the fact that it's a two-party system and a, they're almost of equal size now as a result of evolution since the, uh, since the collapse of the dictatorship. But what also struck me is that they're more than political parties. They're more like mass movements. There's a, they both tell you that the membership is 800,000. They'll tell you very proudly. And that a huge student uh, membership as well, of, of the order of 40 to 50,000 in, in each case. It reminded me very much of mass movements in the, in the 19th century, and not least uh, here in this country, say under O'Connell and under Parnell. I think it's worth reflecting on that a two-party system is unusual in Europe. It is, of course, it's, uh, it is a feature such as in Malta, but the multi-party system is the norm. Uh, for example, what Brian Farrell, uh, the first Director General here, used to describe as the two-and-a-half party system was predominant in Ireland. That half party made, makes all the difference, such as, the, uh, such as in the Federal Republic in Germany until quite recently, the role of the Liberal Party is the half party. What it does do is it makes coalitions possible with one party or, or the other. A two-party system where they're both of equal size and what's in the middle doesn't really matter, uh, you've got utter and absolute confrontation, oppositional politics. And that makes consensus extremely difficult to develop because you're always saying the other guy is completely and utterly wrong. And I'm completely and utterly and absolutely right. And a government of national unity, which is probably required, is as a consequence almost impossible. Now, there was an attempt, which was referred to while we were there, um, <clears throat> to create a government of national unity. I think the conversations lasted one evening, and that was the end of that. Um, I'm just sorry. What I <clears throat> would like to classify this as, a, as almost a perpetual civil war. And it struck me that it's almost like von Clausewitz uh, in reverse. As you remember, he said that war was, was the continuation of politics by another means. But I think in Greece it can be truly said that politics is the continuation of war by other means. And my feeling about the thing is that quite literally you are entering a political war zone. It's very reminiscent, uh, I would have thought, for Irish people of the politics here of the 20s, even up to about the 50s, where the two civil war sides were entrenched in utter and absolute opposition with each other. And it's not the basis of a long-term solution, not least if you take into account the, this particular there is no strength until there is a coming together, literally, literal translation. As a result of this cleavage uh, between the two sides, to use that political science term, the competition between the two parties is utterly and absolutely intense. The winner takes all, quite literally all. And if you're on the losing side, you're out. And what numbers of people are we talking about? About 100,000 people lose their jobs. And 100,000 people come in and get the jobs that the 100,000 people just have had. So, and, you're, and a senior politician is now out of the frame completely if you're in opposition. Which means, therefore, that the swing vote between the, the two is, is utterly and absolutely decisive. What we're talking about, about 7 8% of the, of the electorate. So, therefore, you're going to get this pendulum politics. Uh, Tony, uh, and Willie, uh, Tony and, and Niall mentioned about this alternating system. Uh, and I think that's a feature of, of the operation of the swing vote. Now, how do you get the swing vote? Well, of course, it's irresponsible politics. What you do is you, you, you buy the vote. And you promise lower taxes uh, and higher spending. Uh, a, a disastrous formula. I remember going into Rome uh, about 10 years ago or more, whenever Perlusconi was just about to come into power. It was about a week before the election. And there's no posters in Rome, but there are large billboards, as you know. And everywhere you went, on the way in, I must have a thousand of these billboards, everywhere, Berlusconi's face and the campaign slogan. Menno tassi per tutti. Less taxes for everybody. <laughs> 
You can't lose on, on that. It was done before, I think, in 1977 here in this country as well. But the result of that, of that promising, uh, that uh, lower taxes and higher spending, is, of course, that you get um, unsustainable debt. Sorry, we're out of sequence here at the moment. Anyway, look, what you get is, the point is, you get unsustainable public deficits. As Tony said, those were masked by EU transfers, plus artificially high growth as a function of being inside the economy. And the result of all that, you've got a real problem. Now, the two parties, as has been said, but were to point, just again, emphasizing very briefly, are coalitions. They're not actually parties. That's the other point I would want to make. When you've got this party that has a 40, 45% vote, it really is in here, in, internally is a coalition. But they're big coalitions, they're a new democracy coming out of the monarchist uh, and conservative tradition, and PASOK out of the republican and radical tradition. Now, let's not go too far about these uh, titles. There's a lot more to it than that, but these are, these are the broad labels that would actually fit. And both fairly recently formed, and that's the point, that they are relatively new as parties, but they're mass movements. And they are also dynastic, in the sense that Papandreou is the son of a prime minister who is, was the son of a prime minister. And Caraman Lees was the son of a prime minister. And the current finance minister comes out of this famous family whose name we'll see all over the place because the Athens airport is called after that family. And it is strongly factional. This is the point about a big party. It's a nightmare for a general secretary, I can tell you. <laughs> we, did, we were a small party and we had our factions in town. But because it's so new, and because it's this big, broad coalition, it is actually weakly organized as a party. This is not something that you can wheel around. Uh, the party leadership can wheel it around 180 degrees, just like that overnight. The dream of all party apparatchiks, of course. You cannot do that. And both parties, interestingly, recognize that they need party reform, in addition to all the reform agenda that Niall talked about, that the political parties recognize that they need their own specific uh, reform program, which is to decouple the party from personal dynasties. The question is, you know, will the parties survive after Papandreou and the, and, uh, the disappearance of um, the Carmelese faction? I don't think that you can underestimate the, the influence of history. It's been mentioned before, and I make no apology for repeating it. I think Greece has had a very unfortunate and, un, 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 uh, unlucky history. Uh, centuries of occupation under the Ottomans. I mean century, back to millennium, almost. Uh, then, uh, the, and interference from everybody since from 1830 by, by Britain, uh, by France, of course, as always the case, by Germany, and naturally given the region, Russia. It is the product, what Greece is today, uh, originally was conceived by these four great powers, and, for, and they bear a lot of responsibility for some of the inherent uh, problems that Greece suffers from even to today. There has been the mention of the defeat by Turkey just after the First World War, but what has to be uh, emphasized is the huge social dislocation that this caused, the movement of one and a half million refugees into Greece. Uh, and the legacy that that leaves inside the Greek DNA is profoundly strong, and it explains why it is that they have a, uh, a defense uh, budget that's way beyond their capacity to finance a 4% of GDP, where the average inside the EU is 2% or even much lower. There has been mention as well as about the terrible civil war and the German occupation and the fact that there were 500,000 deaths in that period that's quite recent. And also the fact that there was famine. It's important to know the pe recall that people died on the streets of, of Athens from famine in, in my lifetime. So these things have gone very deep uh, into the DNA, just to make the point. And then you had this uh, military uh, dictatorship, which was an appalling one. When I first met uh, George Papandreou's father, then uh, later the Prime Minister, Andreas Papandreou, with whom I worked, um, he was in exile, living in Europe, elsewhere, in exile, and trying to drum up support for Greek democracy, and not always very successfully. So it has left a <coughs> legacy of hatred you could argue that modern Greece has really only been born in 1980. Now, that's an interesting proposition. It's worthwhile thinking about. I certainly believe this to be the case. As a society, I think there's very strong arguments that it's a pre-industrial society. We, we three and four didn't always agree with this. 
I also called it a pre-modernist state. Uh, my colleagues didn't argued with me strongly about this one, but I believe it to be the case. And of course, it has no parliamentary traditions, which has been mentioned, and it has also got other problems, such as weak state institutions. Those features have been um, uh, addressed before. Uh, they, aff they affect the political culture. Clientelism is always an index of poverty on the one hand, but something more is an index that you're not a citizen. This is the Ottoman tradition. You're not a citizen. When you go before the public service, you're a client looking for a favor from the civil servant on the other side. And you frequently have got a grease as Pam to do so, or her Pam. So you've also got patronage in such a culture on a massive scale that's been mentioned. And also, a thing that Greeks will constantly refer to themselves is um, widespread corruption that goes through all levels uh, of, the, of the system, including up to the very top. And at the moment, one of the boiling points with a lot of people is one particular individual uh, who people believe uh, was the recipient of very large sums uh, of money, when we're talking about tens of millions. Tax evasion has been referred to as a, as a way of life. And one of the great reforms that's got to be brought in is literally put in a tax uh, collection system that functions. The interesting thing, the current government is actually putting in a system which prevents the tax collectors from meeting the public face to face. Why? Because a deal is done in a face to face collection. It's like, the, uh, it's like that parable of the gospel, sit down quickly and write, what, what, how much do you owe me? A hundred. Sit down quickly and write ten. Do you remember that parable? And then, of course, if you don't do the deal with the tax collector, you, go, you appeal and you go to the court. Now you do, do a deal with the judge. And I'm not inventing this. This is, unfortunately, the way it is. The blo bloated public uh, service has been referred to. Yeah, and all the difficulties that Niall has mentioned and this factionalism. <coughs> These were other things that, that would strike you very strongly. Of course, Greek, uh, Greek culture has a very strong streak of individualism, and why not, with the, with the uh, history that it does have. But it means also that there's weak communal identity, and there is a weak civil society. In fact, there's a pr practically a non-existent civil society. This was an, uh, an unexpected feature was the insistence of a lot of people whom we met who said, really, well, you know, what, what, what is it to be Greek? And, I mean, do we have this nationality, apart from the football team? and maybe some basketball, um, the, the language, sure, and a certain history, but the sense of identity that we Irish would have, I would think, as being Irish and as belonging to a com national community, do not seem to uh, be, be, uh, be at least at the same level. And this leads to then a conflict between self-interest and national interest. Very much uh, evident from people from whom this should not be expected or tolerated or permitted, a dedicated middle class, You've got protected professions who are fighting like hell to keep what it is they have. Economists would call this rent-seeking. And it is, isn't it interesting that it's always the same professions who feature in an IMF plan? Always the lawyers. Always the lawyers. You know, they're very busy writing letters at the moment. Always the lawyers. And uh, pharmacists. Why pharmacists? We've got uh, graphic stories about pharmacists who apparently closed every Monday afternoon, every Wednesday afternoon, and every Saturday and every Sunday. Now, this is interesting. Um, think about it. The weak social ethic, which is one of the ingredients that Aristotle says in, the, in, 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 the, in, in, the, in politics, his masterly work, says there's got to be a strong social ethic because what you need is stability in a, in a society, no matter whether it's a democracy or an oligarchy or even a dictatorship. There's no social e uh, ethic really evident. What, uh, just an impression, what struck me about the self-absorption uh, of the Greeks with their own issues. For the last 30 years, they've basically not reformed themselves. What are they doing? Fighting in this perpetual civil war that I mentioned. And who came back to me was Churchill, and Churchill's reference to Fermanagh, and the dreary steeples of Fermanagh, that when the rest of Europe would have sorted out its problems, who would be fighting still? Our good friends in Northern Ireland, absorbed with each other uh, with these historic conflicts. Really terrible, must say. Okay. <laughs> and finish off, I uh, just put up a couple of questions here, which you can think about. Does the social contract really has broken down now in Greece? That's why there's people out on the streets. That's why there's a loss of legitimacy, there's public anger and the street violence. The question is, does Greece have the capacity to do two things or three things? overcome the crisis, remain a member of the euro, survive in the long term, 
and contribute to the European project. These are difficulties that have to be overcome. As Niall has mentioned, a huge reform agenda, a strong political leadership was isolated, and also the state capacity to deliver. There is no sense of responsibility for the crisis. Nobody created this, and nobody is responsible for it. And nobody really has uh, an agreed frame of, uh, framework of analysis. And most of those who should be helping are in opposition. The second last bullet point was repeated to us repeatedly. There's no ownership of the solution. There's no buy-in. And if that is not the case, then you've got real problems. The political leadership is operating off a terribly narrow base, both within its own party and within the parliament and within the public. It's open to ambush. It's certainly open to an ambush internally in the parliamentary party. The last vote, they lost yet another MP, the five to go, and we're all in deep trouble. We're in a red zone. There's doubts over the ability, government's ability to run, to run the full term. That's been constantly uh, said to us. And there's a feeling of insecurity in the future and a lot riding on Papandreou. Say about the public service, Niall has dealt with this at great length. It's unreformed is the critical point, and it reminded me very much, having written a history of the Irish civil service in the 18th century under the old Irish parliament, it very much uh, reminds me of that civil service. The consequences which the OECD made the point that there's no neutral civil service, there's no neutral state, as it were, in the top of which it doesn't have the capacity to act effectively anyway. So if you're going to reform, it brings me back to Juvenal. You remember Juvenal is the great uh, Roman satirist, also very cruel and witty with his wit, but he, he asked the famous question, who will guard the guardians? Which sometimes is wrongly translated as who will judge the judges. The problem is, who's going to reform the reformers? Uh, where are you going to start? And uh, there's no skills, as, as Niall mentioned, to reform the civil service. And the fundamental, I think, task is to reform the culture. I think they're the ingredients that we need. I agree completely and utterly and absolutely with Tony uh, uh, and Niall about, this, about the US EU style Marshall Plan. Mm -hmm. uh, the economy Tony has dealt with, it, and Niall has dealt with, is not the engine. And does it have the capacity to contribute to the overall uh, policy? I'll finish on this. Yes, the cosmopolitan elite. It does have an institutional framework. It does have a cadre of administrators who can do it. And it's an intelligentsia, which is an important point, is amongst the best in the world. Look, we've all known this was a problem. 30 years ago, as Tony has said, nothing to do with it. Nothing was done about it. But it's the failure of Greece going to lead to a failure of the euro, and does the failure of the euro lead to the, favor of the uh, failure of the EU? In which case we should try and save it. Ireland is a possible temple, but forget it. The political challenges are this. The first two quotations come from a dear friend of mine who entertained us uh, to dinner, George Stavopoulos. He don't mind me quoting him. He said, we cannot do this on our own. We must be made to do it. Please don't let up the pressure. No, this is from a man who's you know, my own age and has seen it all happening, and who's now passionately angry, not least about his children's prospects and grandchildren. So it's political will and state capacity. The question is, how do we sustain the first and build the second? Maybe we need formal political criteria for Euro membership, a point coming out of Tony's paper. At the moment, <laughs> we've got intrusive interference now in the internal affairs of one member state, and that is Italy. So is this going to be the norm? And if it is, who's going to act? Is it other member states, the council, the commission, the parliament? What do we do if we, inter if we intrusive interference and it still doesn't, the state doesn't match up? It's a failed political entity, if I may borrow a phrase. Do we need political equivalence of the Maastricht Treaty, the economic criteria? Is the EU heading for a direct war? Every time I see Merkel, Chancellor Merkel, and President Sarkozy going in together, holding hands and coming, I see what Gareth Fitzgerald was always afraid of ultimately, and that was an EU directoire, I think is now a reality. So, finish. Greece can't do it on its own, supreme modern society. <coughs> I think saving Greece is worthwhile. It's an act of solidarity apart from anything else. But we, what it is now putting on the agenda is new thinking about European integration. A new EU is emerging, and modern Greece has been built for the first time. Thank you. <clears throat>